Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome. We're glad you have joined us and we hope uh, that um, we hope that you're joining us again. And if we, you are new with us uh, for our broadcast, well, we, we, we're glad you're here. Um, we have kind of a treat for you for our broadcast uh, today. <clears throat> As those of you who have been with us know that we have been spending a little time going through the book of Revelation, and we are very near the end of this uh, magnificent book. It is an interesting book. Uh, it is filled with strange beasts and all kinds of symbols and angels and scrolls and all kinds of things. And Ken and I were discussing shortly before the broadcast started that there are probably a lot of people who, who open this book and read and, and get bogged down in it all in the middle with all of this strange stuff and never get to the final two chapters of the book, which are so glorious. It talks about um, it talks about the end of it all and how wonderful it's going to be. In our last broadcast, we, uh, we read some passages about a magnificent city and uh, some other things uh, of what the world is supposed to be like um, toward those end times. And tonight, um, we're going to be looking at uh, one of the things we'll be looking at is a, is a magnificent river. And if you'll open your Bibles <coughs> to uh, chapter 2, we're going to read the first two verses there. 22. 22. I'm sorry, chapter 22 and the first two verses. And uh, I'm reading from the Good News Translation. So read along with me uh, in your Bible, if you will. And it says, The angel also showed me the river of the water of life sparkling like crystal and coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb and flowing down the middle of the city's street. On each side of the river was the tree of life, which bears fruit twelve times a year, once each month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Well, Ken, let's find out some more about this remarkable yeah. river. That, that's a very interesting river, and we're going to learn more about it, quite a bit more about it, before this session is over, I hope. In the new earth, is it possible that there will still need to be healing for the nations? I thought everything was going to be perfect in this new earth. Why would we need healing? Or was John speaking on God's behalf, suggesting that our world is still broken and needs healing? We. Uh, we seem to talk a lot about healing around this part of the world, here at Loma Linda, with this huge gargantuan uh, medical center here and a university that focuses on making man whole. But Revelation seems to suggest that true wholeness will only be possible in the next world. And so look at the next two verses, verses 3 and 4, and I read, I heard a voice, a loud voice, speaking from the throne, now God's home is with people. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. So we talked about that quite a bit last time. A lot of bad things are going to be gone, right? But God here, even in the New Jerusalem, is going to be wiping tears away. Why would that be? Or is that figurative that there won't be tears? That's a possibility. Poetic, poetic or, license. Or is it possible that there will be still death? Well, not in the ongoing New Jerusalem, but we're going to be in that New Jerusalem 
at the time when all the wicked perish, are we not? Hopefully, we'll be inside, not outside. That would be an Adventist chronology, yes. eschatology. Yes. Well, we're suggesting several things. One is, eternity is not a timeless situation where there's just no time. We're suggesting that eternity is going to be time without end. It's a very different picture. In other words, there is going to be time. There's going to be Sabbaths. There's going to be months. Isaiah 66 talks about that. Remember that in the Greek, the word forever or forever and ever simply means as long as it's supposed to last. Well, in a, in a sense, Ken, isn't, isn't eternal life for the converted Christian, hasn't that begun already? Hopefully, that's, that was Jesus' suggestion, yeah. So, but for the righteous who live into the joy, of, enter into the joy of God's companionship in the earth made new, there will be no more death. And so that, we believe, is the end of all evil, the end of death, the end of sickness, the end of crying, etc., when that finally happens. So, in the first two verses of Revelation 22, we discovered a river of life. It flows from the throne of God. Where did this idea first come from? A, a, a fancy river flowing out of an important place? Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, sure. Revelation 2, remember that river flows out and it went split into four? Well, there's some other places in the Old Testament we, we see famous <coughs> rivers flowing. Look at Zechariah 14, verse 8. When that day comes, fresh water will flow from Jerusalem, half of it to the Dead Sea and the other half to the Mediterranean. It will flow all year round in the dry season as well as the wet. And here in California, we can understand that. Some places in the world, they have a hard time understanding rivers that dry up in the dry season, but it certainly happens in the Middle East and it happens in California. I remember even as a young person first coming to California, they used to tell us this joke, and it, at first I heard it, and I, it sort of hit me in the face. It said, the little girl runs into the house, she says, Mommy, Mommy, Johnny fell into the Santa Ana River. Mommy says, well, pick him up and dust him off, he'll be fine. So we're not used, people in other parts of the world aren't, aren't quite used to that happening in a river. But look at Ezekiel 41. There's some very interesting <clears throat> ideas there. He's, I'm sorry, chapter 47, verse 1. We're going to read the first few verses. I'm going to run through this real quickly. The man led me back to the entrance of the temple. Water was coming out from under the entrance and flowing east, the direction the temple faced. It was flowing down. Now this is talking about what temple? Ezekiel's temple. Ezekiel's temple. Where, when was that built? Was yet to be built. Yet to be built. Okay, so this is talking about, if we assume, it's talking about the temp, some kind of temple that will be in the future. It was flowing down from under the south part of the temple past the south side of the altar. The man took me out and showed around. Anyway, to, to make a long story short, this river rose, flows out of the city and it gets deeper and deeper as it flows and there's no mention of any tributaries. How does that happen? Is it possible for a city, uh, for a river to flow and get deeper and deeper? Well, I haven't seen it happen before, <laughs> but maybe it's possible. This is not your <laughs> typical river. Not only that, the water brings fresh life wherever it flows. And not only produces a wonderful growth of trees on each bank, but also all kinds of fish. And we're going to find out that these, these trees bear... Twelve kinds of fruit, one each month of the year. I thought that was just the tree of life that did that. All the trees along this river apparently are going to do that. And what's going to happen to the water that flows into the Dead Sea? It's going to make the Dead Sea fresh again. And there we fish there. So are we to uh, understand that we're going to have more than one tree of life? Well, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I um, think probably the answer is yes. In Revelation, it seems to talk about one, right? Mm -hmm. But in Ezekiel, it talks about going along this water all here. Along the river. And they're all planted along there. So, yeah. 
So we've now seen a couple of interesting things about this river. By the way, uh, what it, where does this city have to be located if the water flows out and keeps flowing away in two directions? Where does the city have to be located? Uh, usually, one would consider it would have to be on a hill. Yeah, it would have to be on top of a mountain, or even if it's if it's going to flow continually away, isn't wouldn't it? Yeah, there's no place on Earth right now, and no place in the Middle East that fills this criteria. So. We're talking about some kind of a new place here. Um, but yet it, the water goes down to the Dead Sea. Yeah, sure. The de everything flows to the Dead Sea. Everything that possibly can get near flows to the Dead Sea. It's the lowest dry place on the Earth. So assumingly there is a place there, wouldn't you think? Well, the, the question is, it, water is supposed to be flowing in both directions mm -hmm. from this presumed mountain or whatever. And it's going to make everything fresh around it. So, and not only that, the leaves are for the healing of the nations. What does that imply? It's something sick. Well, maybe. Or maybe there's, <laughs> maybe part of what happens when we get to this new city is that whatever was wrong with us will be healed by eating of these leaves. By the way, is. Is that a common thing? Is is do we uh, do we make medicines out of leaves? Yep. We make a lot of medicines out of leaves. Aspirin comes from leaves, for example. And there's other kinds of things. I mean, it's yeah. You know. Especially around the Amazon, there's lots mm -hmm. of plants that have drug effects. Yeah. Well, we suggested last time we looked briefly at Isaiah 11. We suggest that a lot of the symbolism here is coming from Isaiah 11. And what do we read in Isaiah 11, verse 10? I quote, A day is coming when the new king from the royal line of David will be a symbol to the nations. They will gather in his royal city and give him honor. What do you suppose that's talking about? Who's the new king from the royal line of David? Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. And... Who, so who are these nations that will be gathered? All the righteous, right? This is not too complicated, I hope. It's interesting that the tree gets cut off and then a shoot comes out. And that's exactly what had happened historically, wasn't it? The, 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 my, I mean, the kingly line of David sort of disappeared. And then all of a sudden, here's Jesus, right? Which tree is it talking about? that point when you talk about the tree that's been cut off it's talking about the the kingly line of david that what disappeared about the, what about the tree in the bible that talked about egypt when it was cut off or nebuchadnezzar when he was cut off yeah is that is there a connection there i don't think so don't think so okay. i don't think so well we're talking here about the lion of the tribe of judah the son of jesse have we read that anything like that before in the book of Revelation? We're just pulling in connections here. That was in chapter 5, where it said, Then one of the elders said to me, Don't cry. Remember, they couldn't find anybody to open the scroll. Don't cry. Look, the lion from Judah's tribe, the great descendant of David, has won the victory, and he can break open the seven seals and open the scroll. And Revelation 5 goes on to tell us who it was that could do that and what was he called. The Lamb of God, right? Mm -hmm. And we know who that is. Well, this same individual who was capable of opening those scrolls, what does it say about him in the Old Testament? This verse on, on Zion, God's sacred hill, we've talked about mountains where water's flowing, right? There will be nothing harmful or evil. The land will be as full of knowledge of the Lord as the seas are full of water. So now, we're suggesting that the healing of the nations might have something to do with the knowledge of the Lord? Yeah, there's no, they're not going to be in conflict anymore, as you wrote from uh, Isaiah 11. Yeah. It's, uh, everybody, it's peace. And that and peace comes from knowledge understanding and knowing God. Everybody yeah. admires it. Exactly. So you're saying that these, these leaves could be knowledge too, not just medicine? What we're, yes, what we're saying is this is, we're not going to have, you know, funny diseases that need some kind of medicine as we know it today. 
We're saying that the thing which has healed the universe is the truth about God. We can read it here in Isaiah 11 again. Yeah. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, Judah shall not be jealous of Ephraim. But they shall swoop down to the shoulder of the Philistines in the west, and together they shall plunder the people of the east. But so on and so forth. And there shall be a highway from Assyria, from the remnant which is left of his people. And there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a time of peace is what it's describing. But you, you read a, a piece there about the knowledge mm -hmm. about, God, about God. That was Isaiah 11, verse 9. The land will be as full of knowledge of the Lord as the seas are full of water. So uh, it, it seems like I kind of, what brings my mind over to the, um, the, the sanctuary mm -hmm. of God, that was, that, that had a lot of symbolism in it there that everybody studied to find out about God. Mm -hmm. And then you got Ezekiel's temple mm -hmm. that goes somewhere in there, yeah. which, which might be the avenue where we'll learn about God also. Yeah. So not only the leaves, but that that system. Yeah, and I, but I would like to emphasize the point is learning about God is the solution to the world's problems because uh, the misrepresentations about God, lies about God perpetrated by the devil is what we got what got us into this mess and what's perpetuating us in this mess. So the solution to lies and misrepresentations is telling the truth. So I think that's the ultimate healing of the nations. At least that's the way it strikes me. Mm -hmm. um, John borrowed a lot of ideas from Ezekiel and from Isaiah. Um, going on now, Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4. Nothing that is under God's curse will be found in the city. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads. What is implied by the idea that we will see his face? Does that remind you of anything you read in the Bible earlier? Well, what happened? Moses. Moses did what? Moses wanted to see God's face, and God said, I'll let you see the backside. And, and uh, for 40 days after that, well, he was with God for 40 days, and he went down, and the people couldn't look at him. Yeah. Was, well, but it's interesting that in, in Exodus 33, verse 11, God said, The Lord would speak with Moses face to face, mm -hmm. just as someone speaks with, with a friend. friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who was, with his, who was his helper, Joshua, son of Nun, stayed in the tent, and it goes on to talk about that. And as you said, after Moses had spent a significant period of time with God, he came out with his face shining so bright that he had to wear a veil in consideration of the people. And you can read about that in, in, at the end of the book of Exodus. I'm sorry, in, yeah, in Exodus 34. 34, verses 29 to 35. Can't you also say that when Jesus was here, that people were looking on, him, on his face mm -hmm. then? And what did they learn? What did they learn? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of things they learned. <laughs> well, these people not only look at God's face, what happens to them? His name is on their Forehead. foreheads. So this is not just a casual look. This is a very serious look. What's the implication of the name on the forehead? Their thinking, their thoughts, everything, yeah. did, their actions all yeah. focused on him. Paul had an idea of all that and when, he, when he said in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, what we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. Is it possible that there will be this reciprocity that John often talks about so that as, we, as God has known us, we will get to know him? What's implied by saying you see someone face to face? You actually see him. <laughs> yeah, okay, you actually see them. Yeah. It's direct communication. Presumably, direct and close. Yeah, yeah, direct and close.
Presumably, you know something about them. You understand not only who they, okay, this is so-and-so, but you understand something of their environment, something of their character. A certain intimacy. Yeah. You can so, see the expression on their face, and mm -hmm. I think we've said that communication is most, mostly nonverbal. Yeah. It's the expression yeah. of the words, the face, and so on. We, we've talked a little bit about wholeness. What does it mean to be really whole? Well, there's physical healing. We all look forward to that. Extends to all creation, human, non-human, and the earth, and, and, and the earth made new. And there's spiritual healing. A true revelation has overtaken misrepresentation. In human reality, what needs healing most of all is our picture of God. We certainly need spiritual healing for the things that are out of order, but Revelation's picture of spiritual healing is above and beyond that, and what needs to be healed most of all is our distorted pictures of God. What we will see His face, and we will understand God as He really is. I think that's what's implied by that verse. But there's more than that. There's a ministry of healing that's supposed to take place because the healing river of life also runs through the lush land of the future into the arid lands of present reality, giving access in some small way to the healing river that flows from the throne of God into the here and now. So what does all that mean? Some of the knowledge of God, as portrayed partially by the book of Revelation, is supposed to be available to who? All of us, right? We're supposed to start learning about God's character, about His government right now, right? So, how do we do that? What are we supposed to do? Well, we're not only supposed to learn about God, but we're supposed to share that knowledge with others. What is implied by that? Jay, you're a teacher. How do you share? Well, um, the most common way would be verbally. Mm -hmm. You can share with people in a lot of ways. You can do it verbally. Um, if they have needs, you can do it monetarily. Uh, it depends yeah. on what the need might be. Yeah, okay. And I suppose, though, if you, if you understood something to be a lie, you could you could spread the word that it is a lie and mm -hmm. tell you why mm -hmm. it is a lie. Jay, let me ask you another question. Why are you the, I, what's your technical, the industrial arts or something like right, that? Right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Teacher. Why are you the industrial arts teacher and not the, the principal or the English teacher or the math teacher? Well, because I'm smart. <laughs> well, <laughs> who would well, want to, who would <laughs> who would want to do those things? <laughs> yeah, well, that that might be a good idea too. But the reason we've chosen they've chosen you to teach that subject is because that's your area of expertise. Mm -hmm. So, so what's implied by being our teaching others? We have some expertise. We have some expertise exactly. And what's our expertise supposed to be in? The knowledge of God, right? So if we're supposed to get to know God to the point where His name is on our forehead and we're supposed to teach others, I've mentioned this many times even on this broadcast, I've had some times when I thought I knew everything, I thought I understood things, and I tried to explain it and couldn't. Then I realized, hey, you know, I need to go back and do some homework. And I'm sure you're still doing homework, Jay, even though you've been doing the same thing for years and years. My curriculum keeps changing all yes, the time. Yes, exactly. So. Yeah. So don't you think our understanding of God will keep changing? Yeah. He won't be changing. No. My understanding of Him, my, <clears throat> the, my increase of my intimacy with Him will... Yes. Will what we're going to discover, is. what we're going to find out is there are so many things to learn about God, there will be no end to it. No end to it. Now, many people have looked at the book of Revelation and thought that they need to figure out what each symbol applies to. Okay, this means this, this means that, so what's the time period, when happened, and this, these, here's where the Muslims are represented, and here's where the Christians are represented, you know, every detail. We call that a kind of decoding. 
That's not what the book of Revelation is supposed to, the way it's supposed to be read. Uh, there's a lot of barriers to understanding when you try to do that. Because people come, as we've done here, as you all do to me when I come with my ideas, well, maybe it's not quite like that. Maybe things are a little different. Have you ever heard anything like that here? Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, what are, what are the barriers to our understanding God today? What kind of barriers? Usually uh, preconceived perceptions and yep. concepts and understandings. The classic example in my mind is always found in the Bible in Luke 18, verses 31 to 34. This is, just blows me away every time I read it. Jesus is traveling with his disciples and a lot of other people up the road from Jericho, up that narrow pass to Jerusalem. And he knows that when he gets to Jerusalem, what's going to happen? He's going to be arrested and tried and crucified and all that kind of stuff. So he, well, look what he says here. Jesus took the 12 disciples aside, take him out of the, out of the crowd, set him aside here for a moment. He said to them, listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. Now, they all should have known the prophets like the back of their hand, right? He will be handed over to the Gentiles, is that hard to understand? Who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. Is any of that hard to understand? They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Any other, is, uh, uh, are there any long words in there that we can't understand? No. It's a paradigm shift. But the disciples did not understand any of these things the meaning of the words was hidden from them and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. That term hidden from them, we usually interpret that to mean that somebody has deliberately deceived them. Mm -hmm. But in that, is that really meaning, should that be better be, be interpreted that they just didn't, they didn't understand? It's not something has been you don't think God deliberately would. hidden from them. It's it was, it was because if we go back, we'll find out Jesus has tried to give them this same message. Even we don't know how many times that we don't have recorded, but this is the third or fourth time that we have recorded that he's tried to tell them the same message. And each time he gives them a little more detail. And this is the final time and he gives quite a lot of detail. I mean, but they were so stuck in the idea that that Jesus was going to be the Messiah and he was going to be their king and he was going to get rid of the Romans. It was impossible for them to conceive of the idea that he would be killed by the Romans. How, can that, how could that possibly fit? It just couldn't be. They, they could not, their minds couldn't wrap around that idea. You're saying that it could be happening today? No, we all understand everything perfectly clear. We don't oh, have any okay, misconceptions, do we? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what we do with the book of Revelation. There are many aspects of the book of Revelation that we've demonstrated, we've seen very clearly, are not what you, the initial pressure, when, when you read it, you get an initial impression, and it's wrong. Well, so how are we going to so, conclude sir, here? What you're saying is that this really isn't a real river. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's a real river, but it's a river like nothing we've seen before. And we're going to go on. We're going to talk about the last part of this book. So don't go away. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. We're working on the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation 22. And now we've come to a tough question. Do we have preconceived ideas that might impede our understanding of Scripture, even of the book of Revelation? Could that happen to us? Well, look at some examples from the Old Testament. We've spoken briefly about the healing of the nations. What does the Old Testament say about the healings of the nations? Look at Nahum 3.19. We're going to, don't bother to try to look this all up unless you're really fast with your Bible. There is no remedy for your injuries and your wounds cannot be healed. Hosea 7 verse 1, the Lord said, whenever I want to heal my people, Israel, and make them prosperous again, all I can see is their wickedness and the evil they do. 2 Chronicles 3, uh, 36, verse 16. But they made fun of God's messengers, that would be his prophets, ignoring his words and laughing at his prophets, until at last the Lord's anger against his people was so great that there was no escape. And that's one of the very last verses in 2 Chronicles. Then Jeremiah 51, verses 8 and 9. The Lord says, Get medicine for its wounds, and maybe it can be healed. For foreigners living there said, We tried to help Babylonia, but it was too late. And finally, Jeremiah 46, 11. These are just some samples. People of Egypt, go to Gilead and look for medicine. All your medicine is proved useless. Nothing can heal you. So now, in contrast to all of that, we have a city that has rivers flowing out of it, and these rivers on both sides of them have what kind of trees? Tree of life. The tree of life and trees that have fruits, different, a different fruit every month, and leaves that are for the healing of the nations. So how does this healing happen if it couldn't happen through the whole Old Testament? What's different about things here in this new environment? <coughs> Well, this, it's the, you're, you're done with the course. Okay. Well, and you're failing all along, and all of a sudden at the end you succeed, or? Well, I don't know if you want to say failing all along. How successful were the children of Israel at reaching out to other nations throughout the Old Testament? Poor. Can you think of any examples where someone actually reached out and made a difference? Jonah to the city of Nineveh. What about Jonah preaching? I mean, that crazy prophet preaching to the city of Nineveh and the whole city repented? Wow. He didn't even want to do it. He didn't even want to do it. Well, how about Paul to yeah. the whole, everyone but the Jews, the, mm -hmm. all the Gentile places that he went, in Asia and Europe? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this for a moment. We are supposed to be bringing the knowledge of salvation to the world, right? The Greek word for salvation is sozo, S-O-Z-O, pronounced sozo. Um, are there any other meanings to that word, do you know? Healing, healing, health. It means healing. We are supposed to bring healing to the nations. So it's not just the trees the leaves from the trees that grow along the river of life that will heal the nations. What are we supposed to be doing today? We're supposed to be bringing a message for the healing of the nations, right? There's a lot of, and, and we have to back up and just mention something. The language of theology down through the years, starting from the days of Martin Luther, has been loaded with legal language. And that legal language is not very often friendly to the healing idea. But the book of Revelation here is full of healing. It talks about trees with leaves that are for the healing of the nations. And it's not just the healing of God's people, the healing of the nations. It was God's goal. That was, that's what he would like to see happen. So maybe the time has come for us to change our paradigm. Maybe we need to think more about nations and less about healing, and less about legal terminology. Is there a particular significance in the use of the term nations here? Um, 
It yeah. seems like an odd term to me. What, what, why? <coughs> no, what God is saying, He's reaching out to everybody. The and goyim, the goyim as the well goyim, as the goyim. Yeah, or in, 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 that's in Hebrew and in Greek it would be ethne, and you know, the nations. He's talking about everybody. And remember what was happening, in, what, what was the Jews' attitude about the nations in their day, in Jesus' day? They were inferior to them. There's a huge wall in their minds around the Jews, and those people out there, there's no hope for them. We have, we, we're not even going to waste our time talking to those people. So now, kind of reorient me here. Who? This is this is this is occurring <coughs> when God has come. Jesus come the third time, and the New Jerusalem's here, and we're all set up and everything, and we have all these different nations. I would have thought the nations would have been. I wouldn't think there'd be any nations here, or or, or well, great divisions of different types of. Well, here's a this is the question. Do you think we'll all be um, unisexed and and, and uh, cookie cutter in 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 the New Jerusalem, or will there be differences? I don't know. I just figured we'd all be kind of like Adam, whatever he was. And my perception is that all these nations well, you, that we think of nations today are a byproduct of uh, perish the thought, some kind of weird evolution <laughs> or something that's a product of we, sin. Are we, gonna, are we gonna have to walk down the street and look at everybody's name tag? They all look the same. The only way you can tell the difference is them is a name tag? Well, faces will be different, but, you know, well, I, 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 my perception is there won't be uh, uh, black people. There won't be people that are putty colored like me. There won't be people that are, are red. And, Mm -hmm. and, and Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Well, because that wasn't the way to, that it started. I mean, if we were, are to assume that that's the natural progression of things, it's not necessarily a byproduct of sin, then, you know, well, then I guess maybe we'd be reasonable to assume that, it, well, eventually there'll be people with polka dots and stripes. And so I guess that <laughs> might be all right, too. But I don't know. It just doesn't seem... Uh, I, I maybe here we are. I'm maybe I'm painting this thing into we're, here with the wrong paradigm. We're we're, you know? we're, ta we're talking about certain impediments to thinking, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Well, well I don't think this is an impediment. I think this is correct. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, if, okay. what if we um, we thought the nations were? What if we're just limiting ourselves to us? Why couldn't the nations be people in other worlds also? Because it was used that way when Satan, when Satan was thrown to the earth, uh -huh. became a spectacle to the nations. Yeah. Okay. Well, we only have a few minutes left, and I want to save the last little bit because we're now moving into the epilogue. What's the epilogue? The ending. We had a prologue back in chapter one. We're now moving into the epilogue. Let's look at Revelation 22, verses six to seven. Then the angel said to me. These words are true and can be trusted. Now, does that remind you of anything about Genesis 2 and 3? And the, and the Lord God, who gives his spirit to the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must happen very soon. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. Happy are those who obey, obey the prophetic words in this book. True and can be trusted. And what did Satan say about God right back in Genesis 3? That's a lie. That's a lie. So what if we, if we started out with Satan accusing God of being a liar. We come now to the end and what do we find? God is absolutely and completely trustworthy. Have we learned anything in the 66 books of the Bible? I hope so. Well, why does John even need to mention the trustworthiness of God? Well, when I read that, I didn't quite get that. I, I got that the book was so fantastic that um, people would kind of wonder if it was really... It could really be true. Huh? Really be true. And, and um, all don't the interpretations that come out. Don't you think that's all true? Well, yeah. 
Yeah. I think the I think the architecture in the city, the conditions of living in the city, the conditions outside the city, maybe the garden homes that we'll be able to build somewhere future, eventually, are going to be beyond our wildest imagination. We we know that Ellen White said at times, and the passage I was going to read last week, I didn't get a chance. She 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 would come back and she would just say, "Oh, if I if I could just talk the language of Canaan, I, I, there aren't even words to describe what I saw." So yeah, I think so. So, the question has always been, who is telling us the truth? Who can be trusted? And now we know, right? And the next two verses, I John have heard and seen all these things, and when I finished hearing and seeing them. I fell down at the feet of the angel who had shown, them, shown me these things. I was about to worship him. John is about to worship who? Angel. An angel. But he said to me, don't do it. I am a servant together with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and with all those who obey the words of this, in this book, worship God. Once again, we see, talk about angels. You cannot take the book of Revelation seriously and not understand that what has happened in the angelic realm has impacted us here on this earth. And where do we see that pictured? Revelation 12, right? Where did the conflict, where did sin begin? Where did the conflict begin? God's in heaven, among the angels, right? Unfortunately, theological scholars have almost deleted angels from their thinking. Many so-called scholars do not believe the devil even exists. How could such a thing happen? Why would it happen? Well, the devil would just love to have us believe that he doesn't exist. Why? In the near future, we can expect the devil to perform miracles, or at least apparent miracles. And if we do not believe the supernatural world of angels exists, then we will have to attribute those miracles to God. And that is exactly what the devil wants us to think. Because he's going to come and he's going to claim that he is what? God Jesus. God. God. Right? And he wants us to think those miracles could only happen by the power of God. Well, Karl Barth, probably the most influential theologian in the 20th century, basically dismissed the idea of angels. So, what should be our challenge as Seventh-day Adventists? Does that bring us any challenge? If we believe that our, 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 our challenge, our, our, our duty is to teach the world about the book of Revelation and the three angels' messages, does that mean we need to clarify and, and, make, and, and teach the world about the truth about angels? Surely that ought to be a part of it, shouldn't it? <coughs> and what are we doing? Are we clearly representing to those around us the whole story of the great controversy? Well, what do angels do in the book of Revelation? Usually messengers. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're actually representing God, aren't they? So we can understand why John might feel like he should bow down and worship them. But we come back to the argument that Satan started with back in the beginning. There is a very distinct line between who's above the line? God. Who's below the line? All creatures, including who? Angels. Human beings and angels. They are creatures. The devil is a creature. And he wanted to be a creator. He wanted to be a god. And God says, I'm sorry, you don't qualify. And, and that wasn't an arbitrary, it's no, just a fact. It's, of it's a fact, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, he's the creator. All of us, including the angels, all the other creatures in the world are creatures, even the devil. And we read on, verses 10 and 11, And he said to me, Do not keep the prophetic words of this book a secret, that is, do not seal them up, because the time is near when all this will happen. The time is when? Near. Yeah. Is it fair to say that 2,000 years later is near? 
Nearer. Hopefully. Nearer. I see. <laughs> okay. Then he goes on to say a very significant verse. Whoever is evil must go on doing evil. Whoever is filthy must go on being filthy. Whoever is good must go on doing good. And whoever is holy must go on being holy. Is he talking about humans being holy or yeah. God being holy? What well, is he saying there? What is he saying there? Is he making a pronouncement? No more putting decision glue, time. I mean, put it, putting the glue on? Been made. He, I think he's saying that God's judgment will be very simple. It'll be clear to everybody looking on. Here are the people who are, should be a part of God's people, and here are the people who should, are not a part of God's people. And all you got to do is draw a line. I think he's reaffirming that he's a God of freedom. Yeah, sure. I think that's, that's the big thing right there. He allows us to steal our own fate if we want to. But yeah. let them do what they do. We will continue to be how, what we are like. Mm -hmm. But we will get closer to God or further from him. We have suggested that the book of Daniel is a companion book to the book of Revelation. Let me read you something from Daniel 12, verse 4, and see how it sounds compared to the, book, the, the verses I just read. He said to me, Now, Daniel, close the book and put a seal on it until the end of the world. Meanwhile, many people will waste their efforts trying to understand what is happening. What's the difference between Daniel's statement and, Revel and John's statement? Don't seal it up. Don't seal it up. Sealing open. Yeah. Daniel's book was written far back. It was supposed to be sealed up. Now in John's book, everything is open, right? So Daniel's book is sealed. Does it continue being sealed or does this book open Daniel? This and book seal? helps us to open Daniel's book. Yeah, I think that's what's implied. And is the little scroll that we see in Revelation chapter 5, 6, and 7, the seals that are taken there, is that has something to do with Daniel's book? Some people think so. Well, people are making decisions every day. But the day is going to come when everyone will have made all the important decisions and they're going to choose to be either on God. By the collective decisions they make, they are choosing whether they're going to be on God's side or they're going to be on Satan's side. Including us. And including all of you out there listening. Adventists have sometimes talked about the close of probation. Sometimes we've even called it the closing of the door of mercy. Is God going to, at some point in time, arbitrarily close the door and say, sorry, time's up. If you haven't made up your mind by now, it's too late. Is that ever going to happen? No. No. Well, how, will, how will all this come to an end if that's not going to happen? Uh, he, you have to understand what he's saying there. Okay. I, Which is? I think, there will, I think there will come a time when people have, have made up their minds. Okay. People, angels. Can you think of a biblical example of that? Um, not right off. Revelation 12. Okay. There was war in heaven, a war over ideas. One third of the angels decided to go with Lucifer. Okay. Two thirds Very didn't good. go that way. Okay, can you think of any other biblical examples? What about the flood? Noah spent 120 years preaching and building a boat. There was nothing secret about it. It wasn't hidden away anywhere. Anybody who wanted to could come look. They all came and laughed at him. And the, when at the end, the gate was open. The animals all came in. If the animals could have come in, who else could have come in? People. Anybody who wanted to could have come in. How many went in? One family of eight. And we're not sure they were all good. Not, <laughs> we're not sure all, they weren't. <laughs> not, not at all sure. Now exactly. with that example, though, it looks like when the door started closing mm -hmm. and shut, were there the people of, rushing up trying to get in when the door no, went shut? No, they no, sat there for seven there days. There wasn't. But boy, when the flood came, they were trying to get in. <laughs> well, yeah. 
That's that. <laughs> when you make a decision, you have to live with your decision, with consequences. Wasn't it Joshua so, who said, those who are on God's side over here, mm -hmm. the rest of you over there? Well, look at Revelation 22 now, verses 12 and 13. We're just looking, we're, we're, we're hitting some high points here at the end. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me to give each one according to what he has done. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What, what, what is the implications of those last few words? Have we heard those words before? Which part? I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. It says he's God. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that, yeah. Isaiah 44, let's just look at a couple of places. Isaiah 44, verse 6. The Lord who rules and protects Israel, the Lord Almighty has this to say. I am the first, the last, the only God. There is no other God but me. And then if we go to Isaiah 41, verse 4. Who was it that made this happen? Who has determined the course of history? I, the Lord, was there at the beginning, and I, the Lord, will be there at the end. And we could go, there's a lot of other places, but... Who was that God of the Old Testament, I might ask? It was Jesus. How do you know that? First yeah. Corinthians yeah. Uh, 10, 1 to 4. Okay. John 5, 39. Yeah. Luke 24, 44. Makes it very clear in the book of Revelation as well that Jesus is the eternal one. So the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. There's no difference. Now, the ideas about the divinity of Christ is a clear difference of opinion between Christians and Muslims. And if we as Christians try to explain the existence of Christ and what he's all about simply on philosophical terms as, as the early Christians did in those long councils of Nicaea, etc., we're, we're bound to lose. So how do we explain this truth about God, this important truth about God. Does God spend a long time philosophically explaining his nature and his existence and all that kind of stuff? No. Well, the... It's just a part of the story. <clears throat> the most accurate... The most accurate description is one's, one's personal testimony, one's mm -hmm. personal experience, what others see mm -hmm. somehow see God in us. Well, look at verses 14 and 15 now. Happy are those who wash their robes clean and so have the right to eat the fruit from the tree of life and to go through the gates into the city. But outside the city are, there, are the perverts, perverts and those who practice magic, the immoral and the murderers, those who worship idols, and those who are liars both in words and deeds. What do you suppose that last expression implies? Those who are liars both in words and deeds? They follow Satan. Satan was the father of lies, wasn't mm -hmm. he? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any question in those two verses whether you'd want to be a part of verse 14 or whether you'd want to be a part of verse 15, right? So what specifically do you think is talking about those, those who are liars, both in words and deeds? Who was who the father of lies you just said, Jim? That was Satan. Yeah. And what kind of lies is Satan promoting in our day? Well, he mixes some truth with the, uh, mm -hmm. with the lie to make it palatable. Make it more dangerous. So he's, so he's distorting the, the picture of God. And that's his, what he's always re really been doing. He's making allegations about God being arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, exacting, so Severe. on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a doctrine that's very commonly believed. What about the doctrine of the eternally burning hell? Which has driven more people, more thoughtful people away from God, hasn't it, than any yeah. other teaching? Yeah, very much so. And whole denominations recently, the Anglican Church a few years ago just says, we're changing what it says in our books. Our people no longer believe in hell. So, do Adventists have anything to say about hell? Well, we say, no, hell isn't that long, forever, burning, and all that. We just have a shorter version of hell. <laughs> is, that, is that any better? You'll only burn as long as you deserve. Only burn as long as you deserve. <laughs> and for a, to burn a, a creature that never asked to come into existence, 
no, no, no of God's creation had a bargain with God to to be created. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and God is yeah, love, yeah. and well, it's a hard job he has to try to educate this cre creation. Well, sin is pretty uncomfortable stuff. I mean, it it yeah. doesn't it isn't very healthy. No. Look at verse 16. We, we need to sort of wrap it up here. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to announce these things to you in the churches. I am descended from the family of David. I am the bright morning star. Lucifer. Does that remind you of anything? Isaiah. The bright morning star is a Lucifer, isn't it? Yep. Who's the real Lucifer? Is Satan, can Satan be called Lucifer? Don't in our call day? him Lucifer anymore. No. He, some people think that they need to name, name their black cats Lucifer. That's a huge mistake. <laughs> white cat. Yeah, you should name a white cat cat's Lucifer if you want to do want to name a cat something like that. The real bright morning star has now stood up, <clears throat> and it's, this should remind us once again of Revelation five and Isaiah eleven. How many times do we need to repeat that? So the Bible ends with a sort of summary of all the Bible in one word. And what is that one word? Well, some people think the Bible is all about how man gets saved. So my, maybe their word would be salvation. Other people think that it's a way of bringing God and man together, and that's probably closer. They want to call it reconciliation. But what does the Bible say? The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Everyone who hears this must also say, come. So everyone who hears this, including all of you out there and all of us here, what are we supposed to be saying? Come. Come whoever is thirsty, accept the water of life as a gift, whoever wants it. Water is not an op optional thing. We absolutely have to have it or we don't survive. So in the book of Revelation, we have seen many things and we have tried to look at them. We're going to take one more time next week to try to summarize just briefly some of the things we've learned and finish up the last few verses of this book. Hope you'll be there at that time. Revelation has promised us access to the waters of life that flow from the throne of God. And we would like to access those waters even today. Join us, won't you?